My name is Eamon McCarthy Earls. Today is July 31st, 2018, and I'm here with Steve Myers, a resident of Franklin, Massachusetts, and a veteran of the Korean War, to discuss his experiences in the United States military back in the 1950s during the Korean War. So Steve, could you tell me a little bit about your, your childhood and growing up? Where were you, what year, and, what, and where grew, were you born? I, I grew up in a steel town in Youngstown, Ohio. And, um, you know, back then steel was booming, Second World War. The town population was probably 175 to maybe even 180,000. And, uh, you know, we didn't know that the river that ran through town was supposed to be any other color but orange <laughs> because they washed all the steel and, of course, the rust. But the sky was always orange at night. They ran three shifts, of course. So it was, it was a, a, a boom area, and at that point in time, Youngstown was known as the area in the country, the town, that had more home ownership than any other place in the country because of steel, really. So, you know, I, I grew up in an in a area that was booming at the time, and of course today, when steel was gone, it's a shell of what it used to be. Mm. But we had, we had a unique youth. Uh, it was a tremendous mixing pot when it came to nationalities. That's why we've learned to like so many different foods. And um, I went to a German Catholic school. In fact, my wife and I went through the first eight years together, taught by the same nuns and so forth. And uh, when I graduated, I went to a, a high school on the south side of town where I lived. My wife went to a a high school on the west side of town where she lived, and we never saw each other until I returned from Korea and I bumped into her in church. And I took one look and I said, wow. And um, six kids later, it's history. But, um, you know, we, we were able, because of going to school together, we were able to share a lot of things that most marriages couldn't share because we could go back to age five and talk about mm -hmm. things. And reminisce about pretty much yeah. from the time you were little kids. You know, we had, it was just a, just a fun time. We have good memories of our youth. It was, it was a, a good place to grow up. Steve, what year were you born? 1931. And it must have been a very interesting time growing up in Youngstown, as you, as you mentioned, with well, uh, the prosperity actually, there. Actually, I, the I was steel born mills. in Struthers, Ohio, with his, which is east of Youngstown. And then shortly thereafter, my parents moved to Warren, Ohio, which is just north of Youngstown. And my brother Norm and my sister Irma were, were both born there. Then we went into Youngstown actually to take over the house that was being lost during the Depression by my grandparents. So we moved in and took over the house and the payments. And uh, that, that's how I ended up in Youngstown. But. Um, you know, I left there at age 17 when I went into the service because back in those days, if you recall, I graduated from high school in 49, 1949. All the returning servicemen were still taking all the jobs back. So there weren't any available openings in, in various disciplines. Mm. Like my dad was an electrician, so I tried to get into the electrical union and there was no, there were just no availability. Too many people coming back right. and returning to their jobs and, as electricians. Uh, so nobody back then had any money. They couldn't really send their kids to college, so we didn't even think about college. Uh, so what were my choices? Go to work in a steel mill, try to get in with a trade union, which I mm. couldn't do, and go into the service. Mm. So I went in on a three-year enlistment, thinking I'd get in, grow up, learn a trade, learn something. Right. And they come on, come back and get on with my life. And so when you were growing up, how many siblings did you have in total? You mentioned your, your brother Norm and your sister well, Irma. There was my brother Norm a year and a half behind me, and my sister Irma a year and a half behind Norm. And then 14 years my junior, Denny popped up. I guess he was a surprise. <laughs> so then because my folks didn't want Denny to be an only child, they had Phil. So Phil was about 15 and a half years my junior. So there were the five of us. Mm. But you know, I babysat those two little guys. I changed their diaper and everything. And I was the oldest, so I was the responsible one. <laughs> so I took care of my two little brothers. Right. But um, you know, it was a fun time in the sense that uh, everybody was in the same boat. Nobody really had very much. Um, my dad never owned a new car in his life. 
what we did have, you, you took care of because mm. you had to make it last. Today, we're living in a throwaway society, which was unheard yeah. of back then. Nobody threw away anything that was half good. You know, that's just the way it was. And did your father work as an electrician the entire time you were growing up? Yes. That was sort of his trade yeah. from when he was a young man? Yeah. And, you know, um, I guess, I, I don't know where to go from here as far as talking about my background, yeah. excepting that uh, what we had available to us in that location, we had a beautiful park. We had what we called Idor Park, was a, a mm. tremendous amusement center. And there was just a lot to be offered there for the people who lived in the area. And um, I never realized it until after I left the area that it was actually a sportsman's paradise. Uh, all kinds of uh, fishing lakes. Right. Uh, we, we hunted small game, you know, rabbit oh, yeah. and pheasant mm -hmm. in, in the farm. You walk right out of the city limits and you were in hunting territory. But all the lakes in Ohio, there are no natural lakes. They're all man-made. But uh, if you like walleye fishing, uh, it's a, plenty of walleye to go around. <laughs> walleye's a member of the perch family, and they're actually the that family is the best eating freshwater fish in the water. Up here, everything's trout. Mm. But you know, if you really want good eating fish, you eat a perch or a, a yellow perch or a walleye mm. or the old what they call the Lake Erie blue pike, uh, which is not a pike. It was a member of the walleye or yeah, perch family, and the sauger. They're all the same family. We used to go up to Lake Erie and fish at night, would hang a lantern over the boat, and that would be to attract all the mayflies. And Which then would attract the would, fish? Exactly. They'd be, you know, dropping into the water mm -hmm. and the fish would come up and it was just nothing to fill a bucket up full of Lake Erie blue pike, which right. are extinct today. Wow. But you know, like, think about those times. We had, we had it pretty darn nice. Mm -hmm. And um, my uncle had a farm and we could go out there and I, what I really miss are our annual put, uh, family get-togethers. We had when the potatoes ripened, we had mm. potato pancake uh, get together. Oh, know, that sounds tasty. They just tear them off and eat them by hand. They were fantastic. But you know, growing up there was um, so it was very special. And so you mentioned that you went to a German Catholic school. Did yep. they actually teach German class, German no, language classes no, there, or no. was that it was sort just, of uh, <laughs> to borrow a German word verboten at that period in time? <laughs> we had the Sisters of Notre Dame, and I'll tell you, they were strict. Uh, and you know that was the, that was the whole way we were raised. Uh, what we were taught at home was reinforced everywhere we went, and we couldn't get away with very much. In fact, we were always testing the water to see what kind of mood Dad was in to see mm. what we thought we could get away with, <laughs> which wasn't very much. <laughs> but they were um, they had to control us. There were forty two mm. of us, one nun, forty two in a class. Now think of that. E that could get real rowdy pretty today. quickly. Right. If some of the teachers feel overloaded with 20. But when you look at the difference, in, you could walk into our class unannounced just, well, just about any time during the day, and you would see 42 kids with their hands folded on a desk paying attention to Sister Mary, whomever, right? That's the difference between then and right. now, right? But um, it was, a, it was a, a great place to grow up. So I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about your, your service in the Korean War. And um, so, w 1949, you enlisted, you enlisted in 49 or 50? I went in in 49. After, after I graduated from high school, I was 17. And uh, <clears throat> what happened to me, uh, I think it was in my sophomore year, my dad took me to Cleveland. Notre Dame and Navy played a, a game in Cleveland. And uh, of course, being from a German Catholic school, dad buys me a Notre Dame pennant. So we're sitting there and I'm, I watched Navy come out. And I guess I was Navy from that moment. <laughs> so took, much for Notre Dame. I, I, I took look, one look at him and then I said to my dad, I said, hey, dad, you think I could exchange this for a Navy pennant? Of course, that didn't go over very well. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was the year that Navy very first play of the game, the quarterback uh, faded back and threw a touchdown pass. And the Navy went up 6 nothing. Well, towards the end of the game, Notre Dame finally scored, tied the game 6-6, and both teams missed their extra points, so it ended up a 6-6 wow. tie, which was a tremendous win for Navy because right. Notre Dame was a powerhouse. 
So from that day on, I was Navy, okay? So I, I went into the Navy res, Naval Reserves when I was a senior in high school. And there was just no question in my mind where I was going after I graduated. So I, I went into the Navy. Right. However, they rejected me because back then in 49, you know, it was after the Second World War, they were disbanding everything because of my dad being an electrician. And I used to moonlight with him and help him out. He taught me quite a bit about it. I tried to get electrical construction in the Seabees. Mm. Well, they were disbanding the Seabees. Because they didn't think well, there were going to be I, many I big like base the, projects or anything like that going well, forward? Right. You know, and well, they just didn't need anybody. Mm. Okay. There was nothing going on. But I like photography, so I tried to get aerial photographer. And the recruiter looked at me and he says, same thing with that. He said, I said, look, I like woodworking. How about carpenters, mate? And he said, kid, he said, with your high general aptitude test scores, what are you monkeying around with stuff like that for? I said, what do you mean? He said, here, and he handed me a, pa a paper that listed all the electronic-oriented courses. Mm. So I started going through the list. I said, fire control technician, what do they do? So he described it, and so on and so on. Electrician's mate, what do they do? And he came down to IC electrician. I said, what is that? He said, it's intercommunications electrical repair. He said, a brand new rate, and I really don't know very much about it. All I know is it has something to do with telephones. Well, my dad worked for Ohio Bell Telephone. They got laid off during the Depression. And in order to get back, if you were laid off two years or more, you had to take a physical, and he couldn't pass the physical. I guess mm -hmm. he had albumin in his kidneys. All I ever heard growing up was what would have been if I would have been able to stay with Ohio Bell. So when the recruiter said it has something to do with telephones, I said, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. So I was guaranteed a class A school right out of boot camp. But um, when they sent me to Pittsburgh for the physical, I was by, I bit my fingernails a little bit back then. I was 17 years age, of age. I was six foot even and weighed about 131 pounds, string bean. And um, I was two pounds over the minimum, uh, under the minimum mm -hmm. age, uh, I mean weight requirement for my age. And, uh, and there was something else, that, but, but anyway, they, they rejected me. So I, I, you know, I had this big send off by the mm -hmm. guys in the neighborhood and here I had to go back home and I was embarrassed to do that. Mm -hmm. So as I was, I was walking across the mezzanine in the you know, uh, post office building in Cl uh, Pittsburgh, I looked across the other side and I saw the Marine recruiting office. So I go zipping over in there and I made the application out and the recruiter looked at it and he said, Youngstown, Ohio. He said, what are you doing down here? I said, well, the Navy just sent me down here. He said, so? I said, well, they just re rejected me. He says, well, look at kid. He said, we use the same doctor. <laughs> if they rejected you, we're going to reject yeah. you. So anyway, anyway, I had to go back home. So I went back home and I let my fingernails grow and, you know, the recruiter had me eat bananas and mm -hmm. drink water on the train down the next time they set me down for a physical. So, of course, I passed by the skin of my uh, teeth. That's and, been a lot of water. You had uh, <laughs> two pounds of water is quite well, a bit. Anyway, <laughs> dead weight, you know. So they put me on a train and sent me up to Great Lakes and then for some strange reason or other, the next morning, we had to take another complete physical, and they couldn't understand how a guy could lose so much weight on a train overnight. <laughs> but anyway, you know, they owned me by then. Mm. So as it turned out, yes, I went through a boot camp at Great Lakes, and then from there over to what we called the other side, <coughs> and, uh, <clears throat> to the Class A school. But the unfortunate part of that is, <clears throat> instead of paying uh, more attention to my studies, I majored in basketball. <laughs> so I'm out there in the gym practicing basketball till 11 o'clock every night when I should have been burning the books. So I, I just barely got through the school. But one of the things that I remember about that is back then everything was out of a book. You know, we, were, we were learning about engine order telegraph systems and um, 21 MC uh, units and so on and so on. What did it look like? We, you know, where's the equipment? What did mm -hmm. it look like? So there's never really any opportunity theory. in Class A school to practice when it, with any of the actual right. equipment. Right, we didn't know what theoretical. it looked like until we got on, on, on the ship. So right after school, um, they assigned me to a destroyer. It was a TE Chandler DD-717. 
the Chandler got in a collision with the Chevalier over in their no normal nine-month uh, cruise, and they were just coming out of dry dock up in uh, San Francisco. So uh, they sent me to San Diego to wait for it. Mm. So I was there for a couple of weeks and uh, waiting for the ship to come down. And when it came down, they were so short-handed that instead of putting me in doing my what I'd just been trained to do, they, they put me in the forward engine room because they didn't have anybody to work the uh, forward engine room. So I was cleaning burner tips and all that good mm. stuff and say, what, you know, what's happening here? Well, anyway, that, that didn't last too long until for, we started getting full complement. Our full wartime complement was 350 people. And uh, I think at that time we were down something like uh, maybe 60 or 70 mm. people short. Wow. So we, everybody was doubled up. But don't forget, it was right after the Second World War. Um, we didn't have any foul weather equipment, nothing, because they were getting rid of everything. It was actually tough to get into the service back then. But um, after I picked the ship up, uh, we started going through our shakedown cruises, testing all the equipment that was uh, installed and making sure everything was working properly. And then the Korean War broke out. We were the first mm. destroyer division. There were four ships to a destroyer. And you're always attached to a cruiser. And uh, we were the first unit that was sent from the States to Korea when the war what broke out. What was the name of the unit? What were the other ships, both we the were, other three destroyers and the cruiser well, that were well, in we that Well, we were unit? Uh, DD7, uh, I mean, uh, Desdiv 111, mm. Destroyer Division 111. But um, Based out of San Diego, I'm guessing, for, for all of them? That was our home port, mm. right. And then our dry dock was actually uh, Long Beach. So every time we came back from Korea, we were in Long Beach for refitting. But um, we got over, uh, we actually didn't know what we were getting into. Uh, we trained for combat on the way over, went from the States to Hawaii, uh, from Hawaii to Midway to refuel, mm -hmm. from Midway went in, into Japan. We got into Sasebo and um, we got our orders to go to Korea. And we were on our way to Korea when we, they cut new orders. And all of a sudden they sent us down to protect Formosa, which is Taiwan right. today. Because I'm guessing the Chinese, there was fear of Chinese invasion coming across were, the streets there. Yeah, exactly, they were making advances to come over and, and take over Formosa. Mm -hmm. So we were part of the naval blockade. We were down there for a couple of weeks. And then they sent us back into Japan. And we got our orders to Korea. And then by the time we got to Korea, it was the Pusan perimeter. So if you read anything about the Korean War, you understand. Right, isolated we to the being, southeastern corner of Korea, We were of being pushed Korea, right basically. into the drink, right? And um, it was messy. Mm. <laughs> but um, How did they train you for combat as you crossed the Pacific Ocean and at the, the speeds of a non-turbine-powered, like you, not a modern one, one how drill, it take you, to no, go across? One, one drill after the other, um, trying to anticipate all the possible scenarios. Uh, so that you needed to act automatically. You didn't, you, you didn't have time to think, you just had to do. And uh, that's the way they trained us, of course. Mm. And um, it, you know, if you, if you thought about some of the stuff, you wouldn't do it. So your training takes over. And um, I used to, uh, uh, we were so short-handed, and there were only two IC electricians on the ship. So we kind of melded in with the electrical, well, EMs, electricians, mates. So we not only did our specialties, but we did their job also. You know, I had all the communications equipment. I had the gyro compass, where everything operates off the gyro. And I had all the speed equipment. I had all of the navigation equipment and so forth. And um, we did all of that, and, but we were also electrician mates. Mm -hmm. So we were actually, we too, uh, IC electricians uh, performed all of, all the duties. And how was it actually working with the equipment after learning about it? Well, and you know, and it, 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 it start working with some of this stuff and say, oh, this is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not even a diagram yeah, in a book you, anymore. It's like, oh, this is what it actually looks you like. You know, what people don't understand is, okay, how, how does speed get regular? Well, you have a sword that goes down the bottom of the ship. Whenever you come in a port, you have to pull that sword because you don't want it damaged, mm. for, you know, in case the water's shallow. So you have to remember to pull the sword, and there are ways to do that so you don't end up with a lot of water in the engine room. And, uh, you know, just stuff like that. We never right. learned that in school. That's something you 
on-the-job training. And I'm actually trying to recall, so when you, you were sent to, to guard the waters around Formosa and sent across the Pacific, what time of year was that? Was that a summertime thing, or was that more toward no, a, that a was, colder weather well, time we were, of year? We actually were sent to Korea and ended up in Formosa in early July of 50, uh, just shortly after the war mm. broke out. Uh, our military wasn't being pushed into Pusan. Into the, into the ocean at that point. They were still, the, the um, North Koreans were still working their way down while we were down there guarding Formosa. So by the time we did get to Korea, that's when all of the, mm. the bad stuff began. Right. And, and the but, patrols around Formosa, were you within sight of the coast there or near Kinmen and Matsu, yeah. those little we, islands we just, close to the Chinese coast? Just making sure that the Chinese weren't going mm -hmm. to do anything foolish. And, um, you know, it's, it's a different world back then. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, you know, we, we did what we had to do. But we apparently discouraged the Chinese from considering it to take over Formosa. It's still not taken over. Yeah. It's Taiwan <laughs> today. But um, we got to Korea. You know, the first, the first year we were there, the first nine months, I would say that that was the most critical time for us because uh, of all the activities, uh, everything that took place back then. So it would have been 1950 into basically the first half of 1951 at that point? Sure, yeah. And then the winter, if you ever read anything about the winter, uh, 38 below. Wow. And with the windshield factor, got What's down to minus 70. Even out at sea? Oh, especially, especially out, out at, at sea. sea, I'm sure. Because you had all that wind. And people don't think that ice freezes. We uh, ended up with a foot of Ice. Wow. We were uh, worried about capsizing, so all hands. And I mean, out chipping all the hands ice away? We're out chipping ice to keep the weight down. Did you have a lot of winter storms as well? I know well, Korea absolutely. has very yeah. similar sort of intense sea storms that we have here in New England. Well, we went um, through um, during the winter time. any number of typhoons. Wow. And um, I happened to be in the forward engine room when we were riding a bad one. We have an inclometer there, and it's like a compass. Mm. It's the, the arm that swings and red line, okay, if you exceed red line, you, you capsize, flip, right? But you can always tell, you can feel when the bad ones are coming. So we're all standing around watching this darn thing swinging and all of a sudden nobody said anything and it, it just kept going and going. It touched the bottom of red line. The ship must have been over like this here and it couldn't make its mind up which way it wanted to go. You talk about white, we're all as white as that paper. You know, and, <laughs> and wow. It just touched the bottom of red line and it just hovered there for, I don't know how long, but it seemed like forever. And then finally it just, but you know, back in those days we had no air conditioning. Mm. We would soak rags and buckets of water and put them over the intake blowers to get some degree of coolant. We were eating salt tablets like this was a candy. You know, it was a whole different world back then. Um, today, you know, the ships are different. But, you know, so were the sailing vessels, mm. tougher than what we had, it, right? right? I joke about when people say, well, geez, you've been around for a long time. Uh, what was the toughest thing you remember? I said, well, holy stoning the wooden deck and patching all the canvas sails. <laughs> 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 but anyway, um, our biggest concern was mines, as I was talking to you about it earlier. Yeah, and actually, because the cameras weren't rolling when we started our conversation yeah, yeah. about this, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could recount your story about where on the Korean coast you were for most of the most of the conflict well, and the sort of situations you would face okay. in a day-to-day -day situation. We got into all of it, the Incheon and all that, but we we seem to spend most of our time on the eastern coast, and we would work our way back and forth right along the coastline. Uh, Interdict, interdicting uh, any enemy vessels, um, supporting American ground troops, um, shooting any light at night that was visible because it was always behind enemy lines. Um, worked at, you know, at one point we were up within around 35 miles of that of Astok, that Russian submarine base right. up there. And at one point we were the farthest American unit, ship, or any Americans, we were farther north than anybody. Hmm. But if you ever wanted to pay attention to that East Coast, Songjin, Chongjin, and then Wonsan Harbor, that, that, was a, that was a tough one.
Mm. Uh, we would go in and we would screen for the minesweepers. Uh, we were trying to go ahead and load, uh, land some Marines in there, and we couldn't do that for two weeks after the original uh, due date because the mines were so thick. So uh, we'd go in there, we would screen for the mine sweeps and put out all the shore batteries that were trying to take them mm. out. And um, how far out to sea could the shore batteries reach? Are they like what sort of well, you know, size was I don't the, know size what of the they, guns you know, as far as using millimeter what right. they were shooting. Our five inch uh, main batteries were good for a little over five miles. But uh, what we used our, our anti aircraft, our three inch fifties mm -hmm. for uh, anytime we caught trains coming down, they would always get into a tunnel and hide from us. Well, it didn't take us long to realize that what we needed to do was just seal both ends of the tunnel, which mm -hmm. is what we did. We just entombed them if, if we couldn't get them out right. But um, when we first got over there, um, as we were moving up the coast, they always seemed to know where we were going and what, which harbor we were going to go into and do our thing. And it, what it was is they had these, what appeared to be fishing junks with the dried fish strung on line. Mm. Well, it didn't take us long to figure out that that, that line, so-called, wasn't line at all. Radio? It was radio antenna. Radio antenna? They, they were picketing us. As, mm. you know, they knew exactly where we were going to go, and it just seemed like they were sitting there waiting for us. And what their shore batteries would do, they would, they would be embedded in a tunnel, and you couldn't see them. Okay, and then they would come out and bang, 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 and you go back in. On a, on a train or something like that, or, or more just sort of like they, well, they pull the guns back into, you know, a, into well, a tunnel? Whatever the mobility clips. was, I'm not so sure. Yeah. Okay, I don't think it was rails. It was just they were able to move mm -hmm. in and out. So that's how they kept, they weren't visible. Okay, we, we'd have to kind of watch for them. But um, when we first got over there, I mean, what did we have to pick up these uh, these fishing vessels? We had to break out the BARs, mm. okay, and we would give them an opportunity to surrender, or, and if they didn't surrender, we just sunk them. Well, when we, next time we went into Japan, we got refitted with 250 cals, and we had some 20 millimeters put on the fan tail, and that changed the ball game completely. So, because you know our main batteries in the three inch fifties, they couldn't, uh, couldn't angle uh, they down, couldn't far, angle enough down far enough to, if depending on how close we got, mm. and um, with the fifties and with the twenty millimeters, it, you know, any we just gave them an opportunity to surrender, and if they surrendered, we took them on as prisoners, which was an interesting thing because we had what did we have by way of housing them? We mm. put them in a cage where we had our, when we took mail on board, where we kept the mail sacks, right? It wasn't much bigger than the area we're sitting in right now. Mm. But, um, you know, you, you did what you had to do. But um, our biggest concern was, uh, was the mines and uh, the shore batteries, but mostly the mines. Now, how many, like, in terms of the mines, were these floating sea mines or were they anchored down to the Some bottom? Some of them were anchored and uh, many of them were floating and they were all Russian mines. Mm. And uh, what we would do when we discovered a floating mine is we would try to sink it or detonate it. And the only way you're gonna detonate it is if, when you're shooting at it, if you're lucky enough to hit a tine, it'll explode. Mm. Most generally, uh, we were shooting with armor-piercing ammo, and we would fill it with enough holes that it would actually sink. Sink down to the bottom. Yeah, but what we had, what we did initially to do that, the only the only weapons that we had, that we we take out the M1s and shoot armor-piercing out of the M1s. Once we got the 50s, okay, that changed the ball mm -hmm. game. But uh, I mentioned to you earlier. Uh, when the reality set in with me as I was standing like this in the doorway and I was watching them shoot at a mine, our first one, that was roughly 200, maybe 225, no more than that, yards out. And behind me, I was in our what we called our battery locker, which was our underway shop, it's a cubby hole. Our fuse tester was a panel was up here, but there was a countertop behind me. I was standing in a doorway like this, watching them shoot the mi at the mine. Somebody got lucky and hit a tine. And to this day, I have no idea how I got pinned to the ball kid sitting on that countertop. Just pinned, I couldn't move. And all of a sudden, when the pressure subsided, you know, 
I had no idea how I got there. It was just like that. That's when I said, you know, this is for real. Mm. And that's how powerful they were. Well, when other destroyers would hit them nose on, it would take the whole front end of the boat uh, ship off all the way back to the, what we call the chief's quarters. It would take the forward gun mount with it. And there were a number of destroyers, a number of people we fished out of the water that weren't as lucky as us. And the one we had a protected as it, it backed all the way in, into Japan, um, the drag would have been too great for it to try to go mm. forward and it could have collapsed the bulkhead. That's the reason why it backed all the way in. And we protected it when it went into Japan. Was it towed or did it literally put the no, engines in they, reverse they, they and under their own backward. power. And um, they, they fitted a false nose on it and that, that enabled it to get into Hawaii and then from Hawaii into the States to mm. get in a dry dock to get re completely rebuilt. But um, the mines were, um, were bad, real bad. And uh, again, I mentioned to you earlier when we were talking, I was sitting in the, on the spare parts box. And the reason I was sitting there is because my electrical boards were over here and I used to play what if games. And um, I, I was on watch. It was about oh, 0200 in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I had the mid watch. And I would always sit there with the prints and I would play what if games. I would say, okay, if this happened, what would I do? Which switches would I throw? Where would I mm. move power around? So essentially feeding damage control off, if, if a mine went off or something off like the, that. The uh, generator that was in the after part of the ship, the after engine room. And uh, I heard the mine hit. It hit and it scraped right by me. I just froze. I just waiting for it to go off and it never did. It went out and they heard it hit it uh, up in the, uh, up the bridge and they secured the screw on this side to keep it from being sucked in. It would have taken a whole fan tail off the boat, mm. off the ship, which is where we all, all of we engineers, that was or our the, sleeping the, quarters. They the lost that, you know, all their engineering force. But uh, we broke away from it and it never went off. So we were one of the very lucky ships, okay. And, um, you know, those are, the, those are the kind of things that, uh, they weigh on you after a while because mm. at night you don't see them, the mines. Um, it's got to be very we were stressful always to in consider right, that. Right where they were floating the dang things down, always in close and um, operating. Uh, like I said, we we're always up, moving up and down the coast looking for targets of opportunity. Mm. And there was one night I happened to be out on deck. I was at that time the, uh, the duty electrician. They took me off the watch list, but I was on call 24-7. So anything that went wrong, I'm the guy they got. And I happened to be out on deck. And again, it was, I don't remember how late at night, but it was pitch dark. And I was looking out in the space and I saw this light. And this is about how long it stayed on. So what's that, five seconds, six seconds? Mm. Okay, and I said, geez, I wonder if the guys in the director saw that. And all of a sudden, Mount 53, our, our rearmost gun mount, swung, fired one round. It was 4th of July. I mean, there was one explosion after another. We must have got lucky and got an um, ammo movement. Wow. Way up in the hills, okay, from that one errant light. Okay, we, we, they were unlucky, we were lucky. Mm. But that's what we used to do. You know, we would interdict uh, any of their vessels, uh, their tugs that were pulling, at, uh, pulling down ammo. Uh, we would eliminate them, mm. detonate the barges. Uh, same thing with troops. Did uh, you have sort of a home port in Korea where you would offload prisoners you'd taken from no, captured we had vessels no home and port taken in fuel? Korea. We, uh, when we had to go back for refitting or R and R, it was always in a Japan, mm. and it was just a. Uh, uh, like a, uh, one or two overnights. Right. And in case, like, there was one night we got in there and uh, we were only there about maybe four hours, so we got a, an emergency recall. Hmm. We had to leave again to go back because something or other was taking hmm. place. And how long would it take to get to and from Japan from the waters off of North Korea? A couple of days or? Oh, no, 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 no. It would be. Um, I don't know. I, I never, it never dawned on us how long it would take. We'd leave, maybe get in and probably 
I don't know, seven or eight or mm. ten hours maybe. Oh, so yeah. I, I almost forget how close the, uh, the well, two places really are. Well, it depends on our, if, you know, weather and the speed and, and the reason we were going back and, and you know, multi, a multitude mm. of things. But, you know, one of the things that I was always, well, something that could have been done better to keep us informed about all of the activities we got involved with. We were never in the forces that were not on the, on the deck. Uh, the engineers were usually in the fire rooms and, mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, engine rooms and so forth. But uh, it would have been nice if our leadership would have told us not so much of what we were going to get involved in, right. but after we did something, would have informed us as where we were and what we accomplished. Right. To create buy-in, mm. okay, instead of us just feeling like we were, I don't know, I don't want to say flunkies. Right. But, uh, did it, did it feel like what you were doing wasn't accomplishing enough when you were there? Well, we, we didn't feel like... We could have we could have felt like me we were more involved in more of a in, in uh, the totality of everything. Mm. Okay, if we had been made more aware of exactly what it is we were right. doing, more of the strategic well, picture. They in some were ways. nice. We would we would lay off the beach, and we would we would shoot flare after flare, protecting a, an army uh, or a marine unit. That was being overrun, and we would we would fire shell after shell after shell. I'm talking all night, mm. and um, you know we were shooting white phosphorus with proximity fuses. They would go off maybe 50 yards or 100 yards in the air, and it rain white phosphorus down on everybody. And we were doing that all night just to keep uh, you know our ground troops from being overrun. But um, you know, when we did things like that, it would have been nice to know where were we, mm. okay, and, and just w what did we do? I remember going up into, uh, when we pulled into Japan, I was, um, some of us went to a, a, a drinking establishment, <laughs> and uh, it was just loaded with army guys. Mm. And uh, this army sergeant came over to me and he said, uh, hey sailor, he said, uh, are you shipboard? And I said, yeah. He said, uh, you ship have a number? I said, yeah, they all do. He said, uh, what's your number? I said, 717, T.E. Chandler. You know, I see the, his eyes got as big as saucers. He looked at me and he said, 717. Turned around and he shouted it to all his buddies. He said, hey guys, 717. I, of course, I couldn't buy a drink the rest of the night. We, <laughs> we saved our buttons wow. kept them from being overrun. And uh, th those are the kind of things mm. that, you know, if we had more aware of, awareness of, uh, would have been. How much, you know, between radio or, you know, shipboard newspapers or things like that, how, how much information did you no. have on the war as a whole or what was going on we didn't, you know, no. off your, off it, your it vessel? Was, it was very minor, uh, hardly anything, to be honest with you. Uh, we were just doing a job. Mm. The job we were trained to do, and no questions asked. Okay, but like I said, it would have been nice if we were kept informed. Mm. There were a couple of times where there was some sort of a, I don't know, I can't remember the name of the publication, but apparently it went through the various uh, military forces that we got our hands on, and it talked about the one period in time where. We fired 7,000 rounds. Our ship was identified, okay? And I'm thinking, okay, and that had to be the time where we would go in and you could you could uh, fire 40% of your complement, or 60%, mm -hmm. I think it was. You had to maintain 40 for emergencies. We would shoot it all, and we would go out to the deeper water and run alongside of a ammo ship. Which are all named after volcanoes, right? Isn't that the, the nomenclature that the uh, Navy uses? <laughs> but anyway, we would, from 0600 in the morning, 6 in the morning until 6 at night, uh, 1800, we were running alongside that ship bringing in ammo off big nets and wow. all of it had to be hand carried and hand stored. And what you didn't want to do is get stuck on a ladder because you had to handle every one, okay. Well, this way, when it came in on nets, we'd grab one and walk down the deck and hand it to somebody else, some poor fool that was 
on a ladder, and then somebody else in the magazine they had to store it all. And we were nothing but a floating ammo barge anyhow. You know, I had 20 millimeters right above my rack. I had a five-inch gun mount, a three-inch magazine below mm -hmm. me, depth charges, <laughs> K-guns, you know. One, one properly placed round would have wiped us right out. Mm. That's, that's why destroyers are so-called expendable. Mm. And we had strict orders that, that on those occasions when we had to go out and we had to protect the carriers, they always operated way out. You couldn't even see land. Um, we had standing orders that if there was a torpedo fired at one, we had to take it, which makes sense. I mean, what's, what's on a carrier? How vi vital are they compared to what you know, a little thing mm -hmm. like us. Is. How many other vessels were there operating in those waters? I'm well, guessing you, mainly American ships, but well, were had, there Soviet no, or Korean escorts, ships and stuff? You had destroyers, you had uh, submarines, carriers, you had uh, light and heavy cruisers, and you had battleships, you had it all. Mm. Were there any of the other United Nations forces that sure. sent naval, naval vessels as yeah, well? You know, English, yes, that I remember. Uh, we didn't see too, um, too, too many of them because you know, like I said, we were pretty much always by ourselves. Mm. And um, there was one particular island, and I don't remember the name of it. There were eight U.S. Marines on it, and 35 ROKs, Republic mm. of Korea Marines. And the Chinese, well, I guess it was the Chinese at that time, because they came storming down. They kept trying to take this reconnaissance island. We were their protector. We, f we furnished them with their food, their water, their ammo, and uh, we would always be close enough that if, when the uh, enemy would try to come over in their, well, I guess I'll use the term junks, right. you know, to try to take the island, uh, they would get a hold of us and we would come barreling down through them between the island and the mainland. We would set our depth charges at able depth, which is shallow and just go right through them, and the concussion would blow the bottoms out mm -hmm. of their you know, vessels. And uh, what, there was a time that, uh, whether it was by design or what, uh, we were sent on a firefight mission that was a little bit out of range, and we didn't get back in time. And a word we got was that they were overrun and got wiped out. And mm -hmm. I have pictures of the Marine Lieutenant, I think he was, and if I remember correctly, he was a pro football player, and he was within eight days of being relieved to be sent back to the wow. States. And of course, we blamed ourselves for years that we, we should have been there, we should have helped them. Mm. Well, I have a friend that was, went on to get his PhD. He was a first class petty officer in the forward fire room. And um, he was writing a book on a ship or our, our three combat tours. And uh, I fed him a lot of information because the first time we were over there, I kept mm -hmm. a bit of a diary. And uh, every time we went to general quarters, I had it logged and I had the times mm -hmm. logged. So any time out of the, you always went to general quarters a half hour before sunset till a half hour after, and the same thing with sunrise, okay? Because you're more susceptible to aircraft uh, coming in and using the sun. Right. The but, same uh, golden hour that's good for photographers right. is also so good for any, enemy pilots. Any time in those hours, that was common. Mm. But any time we were at general quarters outside of those hours, we were doing something. Well, I was able to send him all that information. Wow. You know, we didn't get back in time. And, and he did some research and he found out that no, they didn't get overrun. They actually beat the enemy off. Wow. So. That's the only time that I can remember that I lost, that I was on a computer and uh, he sent me the email. My wife was sitting and she was kind of observing and all of a sudden she knew something was different about me, right? And she came up to me and mm -hmm. said, honey, what's wrong? I couldn't even talk to her, right? Yeah. And the, kind of, the kind of relief to yeah, know that you well, were responsible we, we for something like that. We blamed ourselves all those years. Right. Okay, damn it, we should have been there. And they made it. They made it. They mm. didn't get overrun. He didn't get killed. And one of the ROK guys, he even wanted to give me AK-47 to bring back. Wow. Okay, so we, mm. we had a personal involvement right. with that group of people. Were you able to communicate much with the ROK troops? I'm guessing very few of them spoke English, well, but we, you could probably not gesture, really. you know, communicate yeah, with them to some not, extent. Not really. We were, um, 
you know, we were pretty much independent, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we liked it that way. We, we actually didn't like it when we were actually forced to go out and protect the, the fast carriers. And every now and then we had, to, we had to do our duty, okay, take our turn. And what we were doing is when we were out there with the fast carriers, if, and, and as many of the, uh, the flyers did, they came in with damaged aircraft. Mm. And some of them would hit the deck and it'd flip over and go off to the side. And if we, could, if we could get to them right away, beat the helicopter, so that was what we were there for. But we wanted to be out by ourselves doing, even though it was 10 times more dangerous, uh, maybe 100 times more dangerous, we'd rather be out doing what we call shore bombardment, mm -hmm. okay? Because we were by ourselves and we weren't involved with, you know, having to toe the mark, so to speak. And we like that. We like being independent. Right. Korea is often discussed as the first first war with widespread use of both helicopters and jet aircraft. Yeah. Did you have to worry much about either North, you know, North Korean jets with Russian and Chinese pilots? Yeah. You know, and the risk of air attack um, from shore. Yeah. To this day, it amazes me why we, we got away with so much, without being uh, in uh, getting involved with some of the enemy aircraft even though we were always looking for it. Remember mm -hmm. I told you we went to general quarters a half hour before sunrise until a half hour after, same thing with sunset, because that's the time you're most susceptible to an aircraft involvement. And we had two alerts where, for some stupid reason or other, uh, they broke off and, and they broke off their attack and, and mm -hmm. they didn't hit us. But you know, when I think about how far up north we were and how susceptible we could have been to air attack, and well, why didn't they why didn't they try it? Yeah, it's surprising. Yeah. 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 So strange like, strategic priorities on their part, I guess. But like I said, you know, any of our our flyers if they got hurt, if they could make it to the water, um, they would usually make it cuz we could we launch our motor whale boat and we would go in and we would, mm. we would get them. And you know, when you think about the winters, I mentioned earlier, 38 below, you're in the water for 30, 30 35 seconds. You're pretty much you're the a point goner at You that probably point. couldn't even grab a line that was thrown mm -hmm. to you, you know. So those were tough times, and, uh, and they weigh on you after in a mm -hmm. while. You say, you know, this is my home. If anything happens to this thing, where do I go? Right. In a drink, right? And if we did make it to the beach, if the water was warm enough that you could swim in or somehow or other get there, you're automatically going to be captured because you're always behind mm -hmm. enemy lines. So that's just the way it was. But. Um, and so throughout the course of the war, were you there for all three years of the Korean conflict? Yeah, well, our first, our first, uh, you know, we had, I had, well, let's put it this way. There were. 11, 11 major battles in Korea, mm. and we were in nine of them. I wow. was in nine of them. And uh, years later, uh, this is kind of an aside, mm. must have been what, around 1961 or somewhere in through mm. there. Because when I got discharged, I got extended. I went in for a three year enlistment, so I got extended a year, but it broke it down to nine months, and then they actually let me go at eight months and 13 days or something like that. Which would have been so maybe like 1954 up, or something like that when you finally no, wrapped up. No, I came up 53. 53. Um, more April. Mm -hmm. But um, I came out with a discharge. I had no reserve commitment. Well, at that time in the early 60s, I was shooting handgun in competition. Mm -hmm. And I bumped into a friend of mine who was a, an officer in the Seabees. And he said, hey, Myers, he said, I understand you're shooting handgun in competition and you're dang good. Did you ever think of shooting for the Navy? And I laughed at him and I said, what are you talking about? And he said, no, I'm serious. He said, instead of floating around on some tin can for your two week cruise, summer cruise, you'll be shooting in a national uh, pistol matches, I mean, a yeah. fleet pistol matches down at the academy. So I said, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about so this. <laughs> he, he talked me into going down to the reserve center and I looked into it. Now, I was carrying 12 hours at the university at that time. I had mm. a full-time job as a repairman for the Ohio Bell Telephone Company. My wife was carrying our sixth child, okay? And the only night I had open happened to be, if I remember right, it was a Monday night. 
I would class. I had classes every other night, including Saturday morning. So anyway, I'd go down to the recruiter uh, center, and uh, I try to get in with the Seabees again. Mm. And they met on Tuesday night. So Susie told me Tuesday night. I said, "Well, that take that takes care of that. I have classes." And I start walking away, and uh, the, the, uh, I guess he was a regular Navy omen, called me. And he said, "Hey, what are you doing on Monday night?" I said, "Why? What's Monday?" He said, "Well, the Fleet Navy meets on Monday night." And I said, well, "It happens to be the only night I have open. Why?" <laughs> so he let me, you know, I let him, I let myself mm. be talked into go, uh, going into the reserves, and it worked out okay because mm. I did shoot for the Navy. I did shoot in the Fleet matches and. I was honored to be able to shoot with some of the best shooters and our pistol competitors in the country. Uh, Don Hamilton, our mm. Navy shooter, still owns the Camp Perry national record. Uh, nobody ever will break it out of 2,700 points. He, I think he shot a 2,672. Wow. With iron sights. Nobody's, I don't care what they hang on their handguns. The, the, amount, of, the amount of precision that yeah, involves yeah. is uh, So, you know, it worked out beautifully, but. Um, I was put in for a commission while I was there. The skipper liked me, and uh, I happened to be in the office. Uh, I, I used to eat my, my lunch if I was in the vicinity, and then I would drop into the reserve center mm -hmm. to, I'd clean up all their equipment. I'd, I repaired all their sound power phones. I repaired all their firearms. Mm -hmm. and, and so instead of, you know, I ate between jobs, so I used my lunch hour to go to the reserve center. And I happened to be in there this one day, and the chief petty officer heard about the fact that I was in the building. And he seeked me out, and he said, uh, boy, am I glad I found you. I said, what's going on, chief? He said, um, do you ever think of going back into the regulars? I said, I laughed at him. I said, are you kidding me as a non-commissioned officer? Mm -hmm. No way. No, no. He said, I mean as an officer. I said, what are you telling me, chief? He said, you know, he said, the skipper really likes you, and he he's put he wants to put you in for a regular Navy commission. Mm. And uh, if you tell me, okay, he said, you might as well go out and buy your uniforms. It's a done deal. I said, what do you mean it's a done deal? He said, well, you have to go before two reviewing boards. And he said he owns everybody on both boards. They owe him all kind of favors. And he said, you say yes now, and you might as well go out and buy your uniforms, your ensign. So I said, well, let me go home and talk over it. No, let me talk it over mm. with my wife. And he said, there's no time for it. He's got the, it's a freak that you just happen to be in here today. He's got to push the paperwork in today. So, brilliant, right? I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I never did tell my wife. So anyway, um, I was two weeks before going up before the first board and the Navy changed the minimum age requirement for ensign. All of a sudden, I was two years over the minimum oh, yeah. age requirement, so my commission went down the tubes. Well, right after that, I got promoted by Ohio Bell into the data processing organization, and mm. the rest is history. But um, it's, it's a freak that how things turn out. You know, right. God takes care of stupid people, right? <laughs> I'd have been pushing some darn what river boat in Macon right. River in Vietnam. Yeah. It also. would have been it would have been your career experiences all over well, again. Well, think about where would my wife and my six kids be living, you know, if, if I went back in. Mm. It was eagle satisfying for me, however, but uh, you know you have to you have to think beyond that. Right. Anyway, those those kind of things happen, and it turned out for the best. Right. And I was just just before we move on to your your yeah. post war experiences, I just wanted to touch on a few, uh, a few more things about your time in the Navy in Korea. So you mentioned that you were, you participated through the the Chandler's involvement well, um, yeah. in, in the, about nine of the eleven major uh, engagements of the one war. One of the reasons when I went into the reserves, uh, I started a, a, a it was a pistol team, uh, and uh, we shot in the Navy Postal League. I had to get the keys to the uh, the range from this. Marine sergeant that was mm. duty stationed there, and he always gave me a bad time. And we had a dress inspection one night, and I had to wear all my my stuff. So I had I had I have nine battle stars in my Korean ribbon. Wow! And he took one look at the ribbon, and he said, nine. He said, I never saw anybody with more than three. Is you sure you rate all those? And I knew what he was fishing for. I said, let's go into the office and get the book. So <laughs> we went in there and he went down. You know, from that day on, 
anything I wanted. Uh, he tripped over himself to be nice to me. Wow. Right? But uh, yeah, we uh, we were over there nine months the first time, and then we went back, got refitted uh, in um, Long Beach, California. Went through our shakedown cruise and went right back over. So we caught all the real nasty stuff, mm. really. What was what was the experience of Incheon like, and what were some of those other those other nine well, we ones that we, equated we, to Battle Stars? We helped soften up the islands, and, and um, we were pretty much just shore bombarding mm. back then. Okay, just protecting everything and everybody, but. Um, you know, us and, and how many other ships? We were just one of the one of the mm. crowd. But uh, like I said, most of our duties were on the eastern coast, up and down that the whole coast, and hitting all the little seaports. Uh, you know, we would wipe out um, um, steel factories. Mm. Uh, um, we were always looking for trains. We were one of the mm. few destroyers that actually. Uh, were recognized as, as taking out a, a train. And uh, in fact, I have a pamphlet at home with a big deal that uh, indicated that, mm. you know, we did that. But, um, you know, we were pretty much just blowing the heck out of everything yeah. and interdicting anything that was moving up and down the coast, um, trying to not get hit with mines and mm. avoiding mines. and. During, you know. during daylight when, you know, wasn't those freezing negative 38 degree kind of weather days um, or, you know, you know, typhoons or rainstorms, when you were with inside of the coast, what did that coastline look like? Is it particularly rocky Rough. in North Korea? Nasty. And were there many towns or cities yeah. that you could see along the way? Well, yeah, the east, east coast of Korea is, is mountainous and hilly mm -hmm. and rough and scary, to be honest with you. Uh, um, the ports, like Wonsan, uh, some of those ports, like and Sanjin, Chanjin, they're pretty much the exception because the rest of the coast is pretty doggone rough. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, they they would always tuck gun emplacements here and there, and you never knew what you were going to run into mm -hmm. or run up against. And like I said, a lot of them they would move their guns, their heavy artillery, into a cave and. and and come out at certain times, and mm. and you know usually when you're not expecting it. But you know what? If you're smart, you're always expecting it. And, and we were usually always at general quarters. We spent more time at general quarters than I care to mention. Uh, yeah. You know, grabbing coffee and maybe they'd pass sandwiches out on station, that kind of stuff. Mm. But um, you know, we weren't always in combat. Some of it, you know, we were just patrolling and looking, looking for something to do, or we had, we had orders to, uh, like, above Pusan, we we helped extract an entire uh, South Korean uh, uh, battalion. Did you uh, just take army. them on the deck of your 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 ship? Well, yeah, you know, not on, not on our ship. No, mm -hmm. they they brought in LSTs and so forth. We were we were there to fu uh, furnish fire support, because if you remember back then, there were a lot of tanks and enemy tanks that mm -hmm. were ready to push everything in and drink, and um, uh, we were instrumental in wiping out a lot of those tanks. Okay, and um, uh, you know, like uh, when the Marines came back from Chosan, um the LSTs went in pull them out along with a ton of civilians and we were in there offering su fire support uh, doing what we could do to assist so we weren't always in a, in a shooting mode excepting that my IC room where I repaired all the sound power phones was in the same room where the gyro was mm. everything operated off the gyro that was one of my that, that thing scared the heck out of me because every time I I had to light it I mean secure it you had to be careful it didn't run away with you because it just tear through everything. It, it really had my number, it really scared me, okay. Mm -hmm. But anyway, also in that whole room were the fire control councils. So the fire control technicians would be shooting away, they'd have their hands on the pistol grips with their headphones on, fire 51, fire 52, and they'd haul over, hey Myers, you wanna shoot for a while? Sure, okay. My brother once asked me, he said, did you ever kill anybody? I said, I don't know. He said, how could you not know? Well, how did I know what, where that show was going? Yeah. And all I heard was fire 53. 
you know, I don't have no idea what I ended up doing or how much mm. damage or whatever. Maybe I hit nothing, who knows? But um, yeah, we did a lot of that. And so what was the end of the war, the wrap up 1953 okay, and, and then the this, war's end? I, I was taken off the ship, uh, moved into Yokohama, and uh, it was uh, lunchtime, or maybe it was supper, I don't remember, and the cafeteria was pointed out to me, the commissary. I went in there and I thought I went to the wrong place. I stood in the doorway and I looked and there's all these tables. They had white tablecloths, they had china for plates, no trays, right? And I looked around, I thought I was in the officer's quarters mm -hmm. by mistake. So the petty officer came up to me, first class, or maybe it was a chief. He said, well, are you going to go in and eat or are you going to stand out here? <laughs> I said, am I in the right place? And I was. <laughs> it was all family style. If you ran out of a platter that had like potatoes, mashed potatoes mm -hmm. or whatever, you held it up like this and some runner, some Japanese runner would take it off of you and return with a full one. I'm thinking, what the heck Navy was I in? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were flop, flop, right. flop, flop. In fact, as an aside, one of the bad, bad storms, I was one of, I think, about eight people on the ship that kept the food down. It was That's impressive. It was nasty. Yeah, well, there were 350 of us. I remember going through the chow line mm. and I had a stand, I stepped over the doorway and my art table, the engineers were always mm. down there and the tables were running this way and of course the bow and the stern so that the ship was like this, okay? So as soon as my two feet hit the deck and I turned, the slop on the deck was about, um, about this thick, I'm talking about spilled food, mm. puke and you know. Wow. So I went. I was, mess to clean that out. I was like on skis, and they <laughs> they grabbed me and stopped me when I hit our table, and there was one place that looked like it was still available, and I managed to get in there, and you're you're holding your tray up and you're eating like this, right? Gyroscopic so, eating. <laughs> Cliff Clayton, one of our clowns, he always carried a long rag in his back pocket, it went almost down to his ankles. He came in later and he made the turn and phew, we caught him. So he looked around and there was this one spot that was just halfway decent that he remembered he had this rag. So he grabbed the rag and he cleaned it all up and he gets one foot over the seat and the ship goes like this and phew, he's on his back, you know, with all that slop, the trays on his, and he, he got sick, and he went out. <laughs> you know, that was enough for us. We, we, you know, it was it was brutal, and there were a lot of days like that mm. because we hit a lot of rough water. Uh, and if you haven't, if you ever haven't, I mean, if you never have the experience of the power of water. Um, you're in for a new education. Mm. Our forward, we had two gun mounts up forward, Mount 51 and Mount 52, fully armored. It looked like some giant walked up to our forward gun mount, 51, grabbed it and just took it right off its mooring. Just water. Wow. The storm. So it actually jarred the, the forward gun mount moved off of it, its, off of its right frame off or its um, rim, whatever the we had to go in it. We had to go into Japan and have it re rebuilt. Wow just the power of water. We lost everything on our superstructure that was not literally welded down. Our lifeboat, our captain mm -hmm. gigs, our, all of our life nets, everything, okay? And you go back in time where I was telling you that I was a duty electrician, mm -hmm. I got, there was always something that was broke at night, all through the night, you know, I didn't get that very much sleep and uh, I had a work, we had one in, in, indoor passageway and that would lead to the quarter deck and then you had the extension forward of the quarter deck. Well, I would always work my way into the quarter deck and I would sit there, I mean stand there and I would time the waves that were breaking over, okay? Because I had to get into the battery locker that mm -hmm. I, would, I mentioned earlier to get equipment or test fuses or whatever. 
and the waves would have a timing to it, okay? If you could time it right, I think I had to get probably from here to maybe where that door is over there. Mm. And I learned to hit the dogs with hands and feet, okay? I could get in that door and get that thing closed pretty quickly. Well, it's a real world education in wavelengths so, instead well, of just doing it in your electronics classes. You know, all we had was lifelines. If, if a wave hits you wrong, you get washed over the side and mm. nobody misses you for hours, right? Well, that happened a lot. We, we, we look for a lot of people, but we never found anybody. Wow. You get washed over the sock. But anyway, uh, you, you, I timed the waves, you know, and then you get in there and try to mm. get out. Then, of course, you like, had to come out. <laughs> then you can't see the waves. You're just kind of listening. When they break over, then you get out, but you usually get soaked. <laughs> but, you know, when, when the weather's real bad, the, the real big concern is, especially in the middle of the night, Okay, if I got washed over the side, who would miss me? Yeah. Nobody for hours till the next morning. And that was kind of scary. Then I used to look at our running lights way up there, 35 feet in the air, and I'd pray every night that none of those bulbs ever burn out. Because <laughs> I didn't want to go up there and fix that thing. <laughs> Yikes, yeah. But anyway, you know, those are the, f we had our clowns, we had, we had our, our number of clowns that would keep us loose mm. and uh, they did you know they they uh, they were nuts really <laughs> what were some of the practical jokes or pranks that they would pull on the oh, ship yeah yeah well, you, you were always you know and many of us were working out I used to do 200 push-ups a day chin myself I don't know how many times this way and that way and run in place or run around a deck and we, a lot of us did that just in case we, we did have to, uh, we hit a mine and mm. got sunk, and we, we did have to get to the beach. Okay, you had to be in halfway decent shape to be able to swim. And um, I don't think any of us would have made it, though, to be honest with you, if we didn't, unless we grabbed something that was floating, because that's just the way it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But um, how else would people pass time on the ship when you weren't in combat or weren't on, on um, general quarters? Well, there were a number of card games on occasion, especially after payday. And um, what else you did is pretty much your job. I mean, there wasn't mm -hmm. a lot of time for leisure or anything. Uh, you were always, e we were either general quarters or you were on watch. And if you weren't on watch, like we could not be in our rack, our, our, our mm. bunks, um, during uh, daylight hours because we all had assigned duties. Uh, as an electrician, I was I was always uh, greasing bearings or replacing this or maintaining that. Uh, so you know we didn't we weren't allowed to sleep whenever we desired. If, if you're either on watch or you're at general quarters or you're doing your regular duties. Right. So that's just the way it was. And the IC systems you worked with, were, were there a lot of failures with the, the cabling or lots of work constant well, maintenance with that? Well, one thing, I remember the, uh, you had what you call a dummy log. If your sword gets plugged up and you can't record the actual speed, and and that's a that's an arbitrary thing too because there's so many, outside influences that could influence true speed. Mm. But the, what, what the dummy uh, log is, is uh, you crank in the assumed speed based on the number of revolutions that the screws are turning, okay? And the one in the uh, um, forward, I mean, the, the after uh, engine room, would, it never worked and nobody could ever find it. So anyway, I started digging through all the blueprints, mm. and I found this symbol on a blueprint that looked like it had to be a box of some sort. So I had to lift deck plates off and everything else to, you know, to look for it. I knew the general location, but I found it. And sure enough, I pulled the watertight mounting off, or the cover, and what it was, it was a chain-driven thing, and the chain dropped mm. and jumped the sprocket. That's all it was, right? And this thing hadn't worked from the time I got on that ship. And no one could figure I, out where it was. And I either. fixed it. I fixed it. Okay, just pure luck, right? But you know, uh, I remember another night I was working a two a two hundred and twenty volt circuit. Uh, sweat was just pouring off me. I had no no shirt on or anything. 
and the ship hit the wave a certain way, and dang, screwdriver slipped, got into the contact, and I, to keep from falling, I grabbed a, a stanchion. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank God, the, almost immediately, the, the, the ship flipped and tore, it kicked me off of it. I'd have been fried. Okay, that was scary. You never should, you know, I shouldn't have been working the darn circuit hot anyhow. I was taking a shortcut. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we had some fun times. Like, um, we didn't get, we weren't fed all that well. We used to steal potatoes and bake them on the evaporators down in the engine room. I had a friend that had the keys to the refrigeration unit, and he would steal us a quarter pound of butter every now and then. You know, we would bake the potatoes and mm -hmm. slice them open, put the butter in there. And some guys were sending home for popcorn and things like that. There was always soda crackers there because somebody was always seasick. But um, there was a time we went in, in the Sasebo, we actually bought ourselves a little hot plate, went over to the commissary and bought some canned goods. We had our own little stash of food. Uh, but we could have we could have eaten better. And there was one time the skipper, Word got around that we, his crew wasn't being fed very well. He spot checked the chow line and he physically picked up the vat. What it looked like was a, a vat of fat with slivers of pork in it, okay, floating around. He literally picked that thing up and took it out and dumped it over the side, reamed everybody out, and he said, now make my crew something fit for people to eat. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's just the way it was. Um, maybe we had a, somebody was trying to make a name for himself by keep, you know, saving money. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But um, one of the things that I had a bad habit of doing, I had this one particular individual, the electrician mate, that wasn't, wasn't really that swift. <laughs> and I would pull the fuses on the exhaust blower in the pantry when they were cooking. And without the exhaust blowers, it was a sauna bath, okay? Mm. And you open the door and it's just, all you see is steam, right? <laughs> what I would do is I would take scotch tape and I'd put them over the contacts and i put the fuses back in. And I'd send this guy up when Myers, duty electrician, report to the pantry. I'd go up there and, I'd, what's going on, guys? And, ah, oh, the damn exhaust blower is not working. Can you get somebody on it? And I, I'll get somebody on it right away. So I'd send him up there. <laughs> he, would take, he would take the fuses out. He would, he would test, okay, here, nothing here. Okay, here, nothing here. Assuming the fuses are bad. He would take the fuses out, take them down to the test panel and test them and they would test perfect. All right. And then he would actually take new fuses and test those and go back up, put those in. Nothing, right? So after a while, the, when the, the, the chefs would get desperate, they'd ask for me again. So I'd go up there, what's going on, guys? I, I, you know, I, I, I sent somebody up here. I, haven't they fixed it yet? What are you cooking? Um, what, you, what do you want, Mark? You want a sandwich? So I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd call them into a sandwich or something like that. And I'd go, Nobody around. I'd peel the Scotch tape off with the fuse. <laughs> so we did stuff like that. Right. To, to break the... <laughs> uh, you know, spice of life. <laughs> right. <laughs> so and after the war, um, so I understand from your comments earlier that you did become a technician for for Ohio Bell Telephone. But tell me, tell me about your your time in your life after the after the service. When, well, did you I move came, back to Ohio? I had no intention whatsoever of going back to Ohio. I, I was actually dating a nurse in San Diego. And when I went back, it was, I had three months left to serve. And I didn't think they were going to send me back. So I bought a used car. It was a 49 Pontiac torpedo body, beautiful car. I think it had 30 some thousand miles on it. My brother was in the Air Force and he was being sent to Tachikawa, Japan. He was a crew chief on C-119 flying boxcars. Mm. So we both happened to be home at the same time and we drove Route 66 oh. to California. Wow. Right? The real Route right. 66. That's, and, that would have been, uh, yeah, I guess, three, years three to four years before even the first interstates were built, so. Oh yeah, yeah, there were no interstates. Uh, this was 1952. Yeah. Right, so we drove it in 52, it took us five days. We, we took our time, we saw 
the Will Rogers Memorial in Oklahoma, the Pain of Desert Petrified Forest, um, spent an overnight at the Grand Canyon and you know, just stuff like that. Then I let, I uh, left him with the car because I was in, involved in shakedown cruises. And then when he had to leave, he, I guess he caught, um, I guess a Greyhound bus to uh, wherever he had to go. And he, he left the car in a depository and sent me the ticket so I could get it out. Uh, like, an, like an inside parking mm. garage. But anyway, I was going with this nurse, so when I, they sent me back for my third combat tour, and, um, we left the States the day before Christmas. Or, yeah, the day before Christmas it was, in 52. So I left the car with her. Well, I got discharged in Seattle, and uh, I met a little gal up there that uh, wanted me to take her to Alaska. <laughs> and if I didn't have that car down in San Diego, I may have ended up in Alaska. That would have been quite the, uh, uh, the different uh, course in life. So anyway, I ended up going back down, and I could see things weren't quite the same with us. Uh, and then I was living in a motel, and uh, start running out of money. I remember that the state of Ohio held back $350, but you had to physically go back to claim it. You couldn't do it via mail or anything, and the reason for that was so the returning serviceman would have something to sustain himself until I found employment. So I had all my personal belongings in the car, and the next thing I know, I'm driving through Arizona heading east. So I went back to Ohio, and I'll be very honest about something. It was about 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning, and I pulled up alongside the house, side street. Dreary, rainy, March day, no color. Now here we have, well, everything back there, deciduous trees, mm -hmm. no conifers, okay. So it was, everything was bleak, bleak and bland. And I said, what the heck did I just do to myself? I'm ready to reach for the key to start the car to go back. And I saw the curtain move <clears throat> above the side door. I said, how would I ever explain this to my parents if they saw me and I left? Well, it turned out that you know God works in funny ways. That curtain moved. Uh, that curtain moved. But they were all in bed when I went into the house. Hmm. But anyway, I was supposed to re-meet my wife. So I bumped into her within the two weeks later um, in church took one look at her and I said, wow, did she turn out well, beautifully, matter of fact. Well, I had my little brothers in tow. Remember I told you I have four, right. 14 or 15 and a half years by junior. So they would have been maybe four, well, five, I'm, six. I'm hurrying to get out of church mm. to try to catch up with her. And as it turned out, she was with her two sisters and she was out there waiting for me. So anyway, I walk up and we we're, uh, st struck, uh, struck up a conversation and finally she said, are, are you married? Oh, I said, no, no, these are my little brothers. Well, I could see her facial expression change. And I said, geez, I wonder, if, I wonder if she'll go out. So when I got home later on that night, I called her, and I was looking to take her out on a date, and she refused me. Well, I figured, well, I'm not going to waste any time. So I got the phone about this far away from my ear, and I heard, but I'll take a rain check. And what it was is she had a favorite blouse that was in the wash. Oh. <laughs> she wanted to wear it, right? That's how close it came, and uh, we had a we had a fantastic courtship. Uh, of course, we knew each other from age five, right? Lots to talk about. <clears throat> yeah, but um, it was great, and we ended up getting it. I lost a bit to my sister. Matter of fact, she said, "You'll be married before the year's out." Well, we got married October tenth, and um, raised six wonderful kids. And she was a she was quite a gal. I was a very blessed individual, but. Um, I, uh, at that time, was working with Western Electric. When I came back, I, asked, I, I went to Youngstown University and I made an application for electrical engineering and was accepted. Paid my entrance fee money. All I had to do was pick up my classes and I answered an ad in a paper from Western Electric who was installing all the switching equipment in the Bell System Central offices, switching centers. And they offered me the, the moon, and uh, yeah, stupid me, I ended up taking that job and let my college go. But anyway, um, what I didn't know at the time is they were hiring for need. And when work ran out, 
they either laid you off or tried to, if they wanted to hang on to you, they tried to keep you some, uh, by hiding you and sending you somewhere mm -hmm. else. Well, it was working out beautifully with them. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And I was, I, it happened to be in Akron, Ohio, in the main switching center. And um, there was a kid that was just, he just wired up a power panel. And uh, he was standing on a parts box, in, you know, in order to, to, to get the elevation he needed. And I happened to be walking by, and I looked at it, and it was a mess. And the boss was there just at the same time, and he took one look at it, and he chewed this kid up one side and down the other, actually grabbed him and pulled him off the box, and our eyes met. And he looked at me, and he said, hey, kid, he said, uh, did you ever do anything like this before? I said, yeah. He said, where? I said, well, my, my dad's an electrician. I used to moonlight with him, but I was an electrician in the Navy. He said, you think you can straighten this thing out? I said, yeah. So he hands me the prints and he leaves, right? So I get up there and it was a picture job when I was finished with it. And he came back and he looked at me and he said, where in the world did you ever learn to work like that? I said, I told you. My dad was an electrician, I was an electrician. Kid, from this day on, you are my power guy. So I was one of the mm. guys they wanted to hang on to. So they were moving me around to different jobs until work finally ran out. And they wanted to transfer me to Chicago, move my base location and transfer me to Chicago. Well, we were just about ready to put our wedding invitations in the mail at that time, and I wanted nothing to do with going to Chicago. But I happened to be in Akron, and the guy who hired for the northeast section of Ohio, I remembered hearing that his office was in the, the Blackstone office, and that's where I was. So I went into his office, and I had heard about an opening in Ohio, Youngstown at the main switching center, Riverside uh, office. And I mentioned it to him, and he pulled out all his files, and he looked at it, and he said, Kitty he said, you did your homework. He said, yeah. He said, we have an opening that's going to be created there. He said, uh, we have a guy that wants to transfer to Florida, and it's going to take another you know, few weeks, but yeah, we'll have that opening. And he said, you got the job. So that's how I ended up hiring in with Ohio Bell. So anyway, I ended up as a repairman, and as a repairman, we did we did everything. We, when I had a trouble ticket, the only time I had to turn it back is if I ran it underground. But co by contract, I couldn't go underground. Hmm. Anything in the air, I, we did all our own cable troubleshooting, residential shooting, and right. all that stuff. Well, <clears throat> my boss came up to me one day. I had just short of 10 years service. And he said, how would you like to take a test? I said, for what? And he, he said, data processing, whatever that is. So I said, okay. So it turned out that I was one of 64 people in the state of Ohio that was sent to Akron, Ohio, I mean Canton, Ohio, to take a programmer's aptitude test. What happened, the Bell system conducted a trial at Conshohocken, in Pennsylvania to determine if they could mechanize the customer records and billing. And it was successful. So now what they were looking for is people to program. So they went through all of management and they, didn't, they couldn't find enough people that were already mm -hmm. in management that could pass the programmer's aptitude test. So finally, word came down from headquarters, give the doggone test to anybody you think and pass it, right? So I was, there were two of us that passed it out wow. of the 64, and I was the one that was promoted to Cleveland. So I, I had no idea what I was getting into, and I, I heard about this guy that I happened to know, and I called him, and I said, what do, what do they do? Do they stand there with a tool pouch wiring? You know, that, that's how stupid we were back there when it came to data processing. Well, what happened in the Bell system? Back then, it was, you, you paid the price for security, any utility, Edison, gas company, is all the same. It, 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 you could, if you kept your nose clean, you could retire from a company like that, okay. But you paid the price when it came to low wages. Mm -hmm. You had fairly decent benefits. And they used to string everybody along. Once you got 10 year service, they had you captured. Because they figured, well, where are you gonna go to do any better than you're doing here, okay? 
So in management, what they did is nobody may top money in their discipline until they were within five years of uh, retirement, which is age 60, because we used to kick them out the door at age 65. So, and that's just the way they strung, strung mm -hmm. you along, right? Well, what they never could counted on was something like data processing. It, data processing wasn't exclusive to the Bell system. It was everywhere. So we were marketable as you can imagine, mm -hmm. okay? So I attended one of the, uh, I, was, I was up in Cleveland for what? couple years maybe and uh, I attended a, a, a session at one of the big hotels in Cleveland where uh, I could pretty much write my own ticket so I ended up hiring in with uh, General Fire I mean uh, uh, not General Tire Goodyear Tire mm. in Akron Ohio and uh, I was down there uh, working on a real major system and uh, we got called in the conference room this one day and uh, the boss I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I left Ohio Bell with just short of 13 years service. Okay, I told so that would have been, I guess, 1966 nine, by that point in time, nine, roughly? Nine, right, okay. So anyway, <clears throat> we were putting on a real swishy uh, service uh, program. Uh, we were looking at IBM's disk operating system at the time, and um, it turned out that they had 24 man years of programming and they only had one qualified programmer because they were going to do it in COBOL. Mm. And I had a pretty good feel for big systems because mm. that's where I left Ohio Bell. We got called in the conference room and the boss put 365 on the chalkboard and how many days were left in that year we were in, added the two up. So that's how many days we have to get the system online. And I looked at him and I said, excuse me, I said, uh, that's not realistic. He said, what do you mean? I said, that's not realistic. I said, I don't think you have a good feel for what you're, you're attempting to do and how long it's going to take. So I said, well, how long do you think it'll take? So I said, you want a wild guess? He said, yeah. I said, two and a half years. And he just laughed, right? So I said, well, there's a way to find out. And I can't recall the software, okay, after mm. all these years. Uh, it was the same software that was used to put a missile up on a moon, okay? It, it tells you what you need and when you need it, and so right. everything's there when you need it. But RCA, uh, Goodrich had, uh, I mean Goodyear, Goodrich, had the RCA systems and, and they had that software package. And I said, if we pull together all the inputs mm. and run it through that software package, it'll give us an indication of just what we're dealing with. So anyway, it took us two weeks to pull all the stuff together. We ran it through the system that night. So the next morning, we're all in the conference room, and he gets up in front of everybody, and he looks at me. He said, how in the hell did you know? I said, how did I know what? He said, you know, your, your wild guess, you missed it by about two months. He said, if everything fell into place perfectly, he said, and that, that what you're looking for, right. you had a pessimistic look, you had an optimistic look, and then you had the middle look. And you were looking for the middle look, okay. He said, you missed it by about two months, in your wild guess. And I said, you know, you don't, you don't have a good feel for what you're trying to do. And what we were, it was an advanced system. It would have been state of the art, mm -hmm. really. So anyway, I'm sitting in my office that day. I get a telephone call from Cherry Hill, RCA, and the guy said, uh, well, I understand you're not real happy with your job. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, he said, we, we have ways of knowing what's going on. <laughs> he said, so Mr. It. Myers, he said, I have an opportunity down here that I don't think you're going to be able to turn down. He said, I'm going to have a courier in your office this afternoon with tickets to Cherry Hill, New Jersey uh, for an interview. And I said, okay. So anyway, I reported off sick that Friday. I flew down to Cherry Hill. I told him no thanks over the telephone, okay? So anyway, I go down there, and, and he, what they did is they took the New England telephone account away from IBM in Boston, okay? And they were looking for people that knew Bell System applications who were at that time no longer employed by the Bell System. I was one of them, right? So anyway, that's how I ended up going with RCA. And they loaned me immediately to the Boston district, and 
we moved from Chesterton, Ohio to Stoughton, Ohio. We lived there about a year and a half. Stoughton, we, Ohio or Stoughton, Massachusetts? Stoughton, Massachusetts. Okay, uh, we lived in Stoughton for, well, from 67 until two weeks before Christmas on 68. And I, went, I helped go through the conversion to RCA's equipment. I fell in love with the area. I, I fell in love with the district. They fell in love with me. I, I wanted to break my ties with home office marketing and uh, stay up here. And uh, they had a deal worked out where I was told I was transferred to the Boston district, but my paycheck continued to come out of Cherry Hill, so I knew that never took place. So they worked that sweetheart deal out, right? So anyway, I'm up here and I get a telephone call from my my real boss in Cherry Hill and he says, get yourself on the next flight down here when I talk to you about a position. So I go down and uh, they wanted me to take over uh, as applications manager for the world of telephony. <clears throat> and I said, look, I, my wife and I are happy, my family, we love it up here, we want to stay up here. Just leave me alone. So what would it take to get you? So um, we arbitrated, okay, and it turned out that the deal was so good that I couldn't turn it down. Mm. So I ended up taking that position. I jumped three levels in one fell swoop. So I took over the world of telephony, and while I was with RCA, I personally called on AT&T headquarters and ITT headquarters in New York, interacted with all the operating companies, all the large private telephone companies, and we looked at anybody that had uh, 100,000 accounts or more as you know, worth our while. But uh, from there, I got uh, asked to take over as applications manager in the uh, manufacturing markets, and I, I did that. Ended up, uh, you know, negotiating contracts, work, doing a lot of work uh, on a pre-sales basis, uh, placing some of my people in field locations to assist in conversions and stuff like that. Ended up <clears throat> being one of the three managers in marketing that they wanted to keep when they were going to dissolve, dissolve the entire marketing organization. Now this was in 1970. Two. Yeah, early 72, I think. Mm. So anyway, I got called in the office. And before that, I, I, I troubleshot. Any time an IRA customer would call the president or the vice president of our division and say, get your stuff out of here, we're going with another vendor that put me on an airplane to save the account. And I saved every one. I, I was lucky. Okay, because you know if they knew how scared I was half the time, because here comes the home office expert that's going to solve all your problems, when I knew damn well I wasn't the expert. But uh, apparently common sense prevails at times, right? But um, I was able to find trouble with the field engineers. Um, they just couldn't find it, been chasing their tail for weeks on end. And everybody was frustrated, and I'd go out there and almost nothing flat. I'd say, okay, here's do this and this and this and this. But anyway, they got me out in the field, laterally transferred. I, I was wanted by New York City, Syracuse, New York, Detroit, and Dayton, Ohio. As it turned out, the guy in Columbus, Ohio, wanted a job in Dayton, so I ended up being laterally transferred as a district, man, district manager in Col uh, Columbus. We were there five, I think five months. and. Um, my boss came down from Cleveland and told me that we were cutting back all the field forces um, to 20, uh, by 25%, but we were alive and well. Now, this is after they mm. dissolved 180-some people in marketing. Okay, the three of us got, they planted us out in the field to keep our career path going. But anyway, um, uh, I took them over to Wendy's and bought them a sandwich, and we talked about it a little more, and that was on a Friday and uh, put him in his car, he's heading back to Cleveland. I'm on, on my way back to the office to get my briefcase. Never went home without a briefcase stuffed with stuff. With stuff. And I said, the heck with it, with this bad news, I'm gonna take the weekend off. So I, I got home about 10 to seven. My wife met me at the door and she said, where have you been? And I said, why? She said, you've been getting a call every 10 minutes, literally, by, some, by somebody in RCA headquarters in, hmm. in Cherry Hill. 
and they won't talk with anybody but you. So sure enough, at 7 o'clock, the phone rings. And it was Cherry Hill telling me that we were out of business. And I laughed, and I said, I just put the boss in the car. He told me I had to cut back 25% of my staff, but so does everybody else in the field. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound to me like we're out of business. No, Steve, he says, you don't understand. He doesn't even know this yet. He said, we have been dissolved. The chairman of the board dissolved the entire data processing organization. Hmm. So I had, I was what, 42 years old then? I tried some, I, I kept the office open, kept my secretary on, and had everybody come in and upgrade their uh, resumes, furnish all the typing and the mailing and so forth. And then I took my buyout. I had what, about, around six years service with them. So I tried some things in the Columbus area and I wasn't happy with it. Uh, that location. I didn't, I didn't care to live there at all. Mm. It must have been a difficult time in Ohio too because <coughs> I'm guessing it was a freak that we went back to Ohio, sort of you know, from messed up the economy in a lot of ways. Chester, Ohio, state. to Stoughton, Massachusetts, to Cherry Hill, New Jersey, to, to Columbus, Ohio. So anyway, I went home and I put the map of the country on the table and I said, honey, where do you want to live? And she said, we're going to move again. Now we had only been there five months. Mm. And uh, RCA, uh, I, I can't say anything bad about them. They were a great company. Um, unlike the Bell System, the Bell System took forever to do things because they had no competition at that time. Okay, we could turn on a dime, and we did. In fact, we even spent a million dollars and developed a software system just for AT&T, but we couldn't market it that way. We had to make it look like we marketed it to the whole world, but it was specifically for AT&T. But anyway, uh, um, I said, yeah, I'm not happy here at all. And I said, where would you like to live? And she said, well, did, did you like living in Massachusetts as, as much as I did when we were up there? I said, yeah, we fell in love with New England. I, she said, any chance that we could go back? And I said, yeah, well, I, I should be a matter of a telephone call because I saved some jobs up here. It turned out that the um, division manager ended up vice president. District manager ended up division manager, and one of the other guys ended up a division a district manager based on what I did for them when I was up here. And that's what it took a telephone call. And I had to take a, a pretty serious pay cut and a cutback in title when I joined New England Telephone in uh, 72. And that was based in Cambridge. They have their big office in East Cambridge, or am I no, getting that I confused with a different up, phone company? No, I ended up actually being hired to uh, take over the automatic test frames in a brand new, what they call a 4A office. It was a big switching center. They were building four of them, and it was going to handle nothing but toll or long-distance mm -hmm. traffic, okay? It was going to be at Waverly Road in Framingham, so that's where they hired me for. So anyway... Uh, they had me in a training environment. We were actually training all the people that were going to be maintaining all of these all of these offices. So it was a good deal for us in the sense that we could pretty much hand select the people who wanted to have work for us. Well, I had done a lot of work with RCA when it came to training. Uh, I had some good ideas about uh, simplifying the training process by using Walt Disney's approach when it came to watching data flow go through the computer, watching all the interrupts and so forth. So uh, anyway, some of that rubbed off and I got promoted in 11 months when no promotions were being for white males were going through the mill. In fact, they told me that when the paperwork hit the vice president's desk, he took one look at it and he threw it back at him and said, what are you giving me this for? He said, "This, I, you know I can't, I can't do anything about this, white male. And then all of a sudden they said he grabbed it back from them and he looked at it again and they said, Steve Myers. He said, the only Steve Myers I know of was a guy that was up here with RCA. Mm. And he said, yeah, that's the same guy. And they said he couldn't get his pin out fast enough. <laughs> well, I saved a job, you know, he didn't right. get any promoted because of me. And, uh, that's how things kind of took care of themselves. Mm -hmm. so I ended up retiring from New England Telephone. I, I did a lot of different things with them. Yeah. The latest job I had, I ran the outside plant training schools for the whole of New England. Okay, I had several different schools, mm -hmm. and uh, we did some pretty wonderful things. I, I 
converted a lot of the self instructional courses to uh, instructor led and I built small villages or towns and I made instead of everything out of a book I made them do okay they were teaching star drilling and masonry out of a book I had a contractor come in and build me a brick wall and I had them mm. do it and I built two-sided buildings a front and a side I actually had them pull a truck up there and hang the drop wire and stuff like that mm. okay quite the alternative and, to class A yeah, school in the 50s right and uh, you know, I had, I had a great career, but I probably had about four or five different careers along mm. the way because I did so many different things. And but you said you came to Franklin in 1972 in connection with that, that job with New England Telephone. Yeah, and, and it turned out I never ended up taking that job. Okay, oh, I yeah. got promoted into uh, uh, their training organization, and from there I got uh, uh, moved into um, a Revenue Matters. Um, it was it, that department deals with the public utilities commissions. We work on all the different rate structures and so forth. And because of my data background, I I did some things for them that they couldn't think. Uh, their their so-called data experts that couldn't be done. But I, mm. I I developed the programs for them. Okay, I did a lot of unique things. But I discovered that I was being trained as a, what they call a, well, it's a witness for the company. I would have been on a stand. And part of the training is what they call a bag man. You're supporting the witness. I'm sitting there with a briefcase stuff of, of, uh, with material that he possibly could ne uh, need when he's on the stand at a, at a hearing. And I'm thought, watching the flow and I'm feeding him mm. whatever he needs, okay? And that's part of the training process. And then, uh, I was the bag man for a big rate case hearing up in Mount Pelia. And you know, it hit me while I was up there and I, w I was watching you know, what was taking place and I said, you know, I don't need this anymore. So I decided I didn't want to do that. So I asked out and um, that's when I took over all of the training for all of New England. So it was, it was a very interesting career. Mm. And did your did your children graduate from Franklin High School? Because if yeah, I'm doing the math actually, correctly, they son, would have been just okay. finishing up high school at that point in time. Uh, everyone except my eldest daughter, she graduated from a school in Columbus, and uh, she ended up going to Youngstown College, uh, which is now Youngstown State. Um, and and she met her husband as a senior, and that was a tough move because we moved from Cherry Hill to Columbus. And she said, Dad, I'm going, I'm going into my senior year and I, I mm. won't know anybody. And she meets her husband and they have a great marriage. <laughs> but um, all my other kids graduated from uh, uh, Franklin and my son Don was number one in his uh, high school graduating class and he was accepted by both the uh, Coast Guard Academy and the uh, Air Force Academy. And he chose the Air Force Academy because mm. he thought his chances of flying would be better there. And today he's a pilot for Delta. He flew wow. C-130s. Turned out that after he got out of the Air Force, he went in, and joined the Coast Guard. He flew C-130s for the Coast Guard. We'll have to have him <laughs> in for a veterans <laughs> interview one of these days. <laughs> he's quite a dynamic individual. I'll, I'll, I'm blessed. All my kids have done extremely well for themselves. So they're all financially independent, all married well, and I'm a very blessed guy, truly. That's great. Steve, thank you so much for your time today. This has been an absolutely outstanding interview. We really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to share your story today. Well, and, like I uh, told you, Dale has a funny way of getting us. <laughs> <laughs> Dale Kurtz, he's got his, his, his tricks up his sleeve. It, it's, kind of, it's been fun. It's been interesting because yeah. I had no idea I was going to get into anything like this. But uh, I hope I satisfy your needs. Absolutely. This has been a tremendous interview. Thank you so much. Okay, Dale. Thank you. <laughs> This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.